tell who's knocking? Am I not the friend you sent out into the night to check on the howlers? Howlers that scream so deliciously in their stables. They are silent now. Did you notice? I quieted them well. It was not kind of you to send me out into the night. I had to endure the winds of pandemonium while all of you were safe inside. Things lurk in the darkness that make even the walk from the inn to the stable treacherous. Why won't you let me in? That's not kind either. Can't you see it's me standing at the window? Or do you no longer know who I am? Perhaps you fear this body is a husk holding something terrible within it. That eventually something will tear through this feeble shell. You think I'm a Murska, one of the great beetle beasts out on the plains. You've seen their tracks today, the molted shreds of skin they leave behind. Now you fear the friend you see has become one of them, that he is only the last unmalted remains of the beast's dinner. Or perhaps I'm me, and the Mursk is hunting out here. Let me in, you perks, before it's too late. What's wrong? It's only the wind that makes my voice buzz like an insect's. Why are you staring at my face? Is something happening? Hello, and welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we take old creatures from past editions of D&D and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition game. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we're going to be talking about a creature that takes the phrase, you are what you eat, to a literal next level. This creature originally debuted in the Plains of Chaos book, which was originally put out as part of the Planescape setting. Native to the plane of Pandemonium, where chaos reigns, the Murska is a giant, human-sized beetle creature that hunts in packs with others of its kind. Now that may sound scary enough as it is, but what's truly terrifying about these creatures is what happens in the aftermath of a meal. Whenever a Murska consumes another creature, whatever it is, it takes on some of the traits and appearance of that creature. The Murska shown in the image that's given to us in the book appears to have just eaten some kind of polar bear. The outer layer of their chitinous shell grows and reforms to mask and duplicate whatever it was that they ate. It is actually a terrible disguise because anybody looking at this creature for more than a few moments of scrutiny will realize that what they're looking at is not in fact a polar bear or a horse or whatever the creature last happened to consume. However, in a dark place, being watched by a creature who might not have extremely keen vision, it's possible it could pass itself off as whatever it last consumed. So today we're going to talk about just what these things can do in battle, and some plot hooks for how we want to implement these creatures in our games. But first things first, do not split the party, because it's time for... So as I mentioned, these creatures hunt in packs. Now unlike some of the nastier creatures that can be found on many of the chaotic plains, the Murska doesn't indulge itself in wanton slaughter. They hunt and they eat other living creatures, but whatever they need to survive is more than enough. They're not going to go in destroying villages just for the sake of bloody murder. The primary means of assault is the two massive mandibles affixed to the front of the creature's face. They can cause a pretty severe amount of damage, and they also are great for grappling targets and dragging them away. So if they're able to subdue their prey, even if they're still kicking and they can take them back to their hive where they can then eat them, as this is what they're doing, they're literally hunting for survival, then that's great for them. They also have claws that can do a pretty okay amount of damage. They're definitely just kind of auxiliary attacks where the jaws are really the main thing you want to watch out for. And they are fairly intelligent for a monstrosity. They're not going to be winning any scientific achievement awards or anything, but they are pretty smart the way they approach combat. And this is reflected by the fact that they have pack tactics, granting them advantage whenever another one of their allies is within melee range of whatever they're attacking. And their grizzly disguise is useful for a little bit more than just simple shock factor. While that's definitely a huge part of it, 
The Murska's disguise can be used to try to manipulate its prey, potentially leading them into a dangerous situation. As I mentioned, they take on some of the appearance and gain some of the traits of the creature which they last consumed, so if it happens to be some kind of beast that roams the area where the Murskas primarily hunt, they may be able to trick a herd of those beasts or a few of them to come in closer, thinking that the Murska is in fact one of their own, only to then attack this creature when it's too late. Now eventually the shell will be molted and that kind of leaves the Murska in an awkward position when this starts to happen because over the course of about a week or so this shell will peel off and bits and chunks of it will be left behind meaning that a Murska who fed four or five days ago might look more beetle than whatever the last thing it ate but yet it will still have parts of its body that kind of vaguely resemble the last thing it consumed which is pretty unsettling and this is usually how I would present this monster to a group of adventurers in a random encounter, is that they don't really look like howlers, but they kind of have bits of skin in the big, like, chin thing that howlers have kind of hanging from underneath their necks. This also means, though, it is easy to tell how hungry a Murska is based on how much of its true form is showing. A Murska that is really only displaying its beetle form is starving because it hasn't eaten in quite some time. And a starving carnivore is definitely going to be the most desperate and therefore the most dangerous. Where things get interesting though is when a Murska consumes an intelligent creature such as a human or an elf or a dwarf. And by interesting of course I mean horrific in the most Geiger-esque way possible. The results, as you can probably imagine, are quite unsettling, but they do leave us with a whole myriad of when a Murska consumes a creature, as I mentioned, it takes on some of its traits and tendencies, maybe even a small bit of its personality. But part of that means it also gains some intelligence from the creature and part of its mind if that creature was a sentient being. This means that what was essentially a savage pack hunter who was an animal is now not only sentient, but completely aware of what it is. This of course creates a dilemma for the Murska. For when a Murska sheds its outer shell, it of course also casts off any remnant of whatever remained within itself of the creature it last consumed. It's usually just eating beasts and other monsters, so this is fine. But with the gift of sentience also comes the curse of awareness. Awareness of your own mortality. Awareness of the situation that you're currently in. Awareness that if you don't eat another sentient creature by the time you shed your shell, that sentience in your sense of being and individuality that you've now gained, and you now start to like, is all going to disappear, and you'll go back to what you were before. But with this new intelligence also comes a new level of problem solving that the Murska didn't have before. Surely a Murska that's tasted the fruit of sentience will need and want to keep that going. At first, it might try to take people from small villages and towns, turning the group of Murska that once were happy to roam in the caves and hunt monsters in the wasteland are now attacking civilization in a much smarter and stealthier way than they were before. But of course, this isn't sustainable. Eventually, the townsfolk are going to get wise, and eventually they're going to put measures in place to ensure that they aren't being hunted by the Murskas in their own home. Eventually, a Murska or group of Murska might get the idea to hire mercenaries and task them with capturing large amounts of slaves to basically be taken by the Murska and kept and used as food. Maybe the Murska even builds a town, city, or civilization around itself and its pack so that they can continuously get this source of sentience that they need while the general populace has no idea what's actually going on around them. And of course, we don't want to forget, the Murska will be a grotesque imitation of whatever creature it last consumed, so maybe it wears that openly and every few days its appearance is constantly shifting into a myriad of faces and you never really know what this creature is going to look like when you see it. Or perhaps it wears big bulky billowing cloaks that only reveal its eyes so it doesn't show too much of itself and you never really know who's underneath all these layers. Whatever it chooses to do, a Murska impersonating a human being or any other type of sentient life form is truly a vile thing. Hey, your skin is hanging off your bones. Oh, yeah. Ah. 
Is that letter? While not necessarily immediately obvious, it can be a pretty thinly veiled disguise, especially if we're approaching feeding time. But like I said, you could pretty much do this in two different ways, either as kind of a shadowy operative who doesn't reveal its true form, or it could use it as an intimidation tool, totally showing what it is and it doesn't care because it has so much power over the situation. Now all that world building and ideas aside, you can also totally use these guys as just a random encounter. They might attack during the night or during the day or be encountered in a dungeon. Whatever the situation is, they're just kind of a horrific version of a pack hunter that exists on another plane and is totally something you'd expect to encounter in a place like Pandemonium. And while they are very much from Pandemonium in the lore we have, you can very easily throw that all away and because it's not really essential to what they are and just kind of use them on the material plane or the ethereal plane or wherever your current adventure happens to be taking place. I mean, there's tons of stuff weirder than this that exists on the material plane, so it's not too much of a stretch to say that they would encounter it in a cave system somewhere underneath the yawning portal. The other way you could use a Merska is to have them be kind of a friendly NPC, not necessarily one the party enjoys hanging around with, but an NPC quest giver or frenemy to the party that they don't realize is a Merska or the true dark nature of how it maintains its intelligence could be a really fascinating character for the party to interact with, and even more fascinating when they figure out what it is and how it maintains that level of intelligence. Could be an interesting dilemma to put them in for sure, especially if they're relying on that NPC and then suddenly they realize it's this horrible monster. Could be neat. I feel like it would definitely take strides to keep its identity hidden from people it thinks would turn on it if they realized what it actually was, but I would also definitely throw in a few hints to kind of tip off your players that something's not quite right until they figure it out, of course. All in all, the Murska is vile, fascinating, and disgustingly creepy. All things I love in a D&D monster. If you've ever played in a Planescape game and you've had these guys used on you or used on you otherwise by a very malicious DM, definitely tell us about that in the comments below. Or if you've got plans for how you want to use these in your game, I would love to hear about that down there as well. Of course, if you do want to use the Murska in your game, you can find the stat block created by yours truly in the description below. There's a Google document that has everything you will need to run this monster. And of course, if you are one of my fantastic patrons, thank you guys so much. You can find a D&D kind of monster manual style stat block on the Patreon page there as well. And also in the description down there, you can find all the links to Discord, Twitter, all that good stuff. And something else I'd also like to mention is this coming Sunday, December 9th, is when we'll be returning to our Yarviskir Here Be Heroes D&D stream hosted by my good friend Ollie over on his Twitch channel. I'll leave a link to that down there as well. If you like D&D, you like Vikings, you like adventure, uh, we just took a little break and we're getting back to it and things are getting pretty intense over there, so definitely check that out if you've got the time as well. In any case, thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate it and I will see you in the next one. Till then.